We are convened in bank to review the August 2006 District Court judgment in Omari v. Wright. Mr. Hafford. Good morning, Your Honor. May it please the Court, Jonathan Hafitz for Ali Omari. Whatever the line between civilian and military jurisdiction might be in other cases, the Executive has crossed it here. As a person lawfully residing in this country, Mr. Omari cannot be detained as an enemy combatant for three reasons, any one of which requires relief be granted. He is not a member of the armed forces of an enemy nation, there is no battlefield connection, and there was nothing necessary or appropriate about locking him in a Navy brig after he had already been detained by civilian authorities for over 17 months on criminal charges and less than a month before his trial was scheduled to begin. To conclude otherwise would sanction a power the President has never had and was never meant to have, the power to militarize the arrest of any person living in this country on his say-so and deny them the right to test the allegations against them at trial. If we assume that we have jurisdiction over this appeal, under your approach, which the panel majority opinion adopted, even if the President knew that the 9-11 hijackers were about to board the plane, he couldn't have militarily detained any of them before they got on the plane without violating the laws of war. Would that be correct? Your Honor, our position is this. The President has authority as Commander-in-Chief to repel sudden attacks. What the President does not have is the authority to detain and to detain indefinitely an individual in this country. Your Honor. What would be your answer to my question? That the President could have used force to prevent the attacks if necessary, as could law enforcement, but no, Your Honor, the President could not militarily detain those individuals once they were in custody. Once they were in custody, the civilian criminal process had to take over. If they weren't in custody, they wouldn't have been picked up. To be clear, Your Honor, again, the President can use necessary force to prevent an imminent attack. That meant grabbing people to prevent it. The President would have authority to do that. But at that point, once the individuals were taken, the criminal process must take over. Does the President need the authority from the AUMF to stop these planes? Couldn't the President have shot down the planes? That is absolutely. There's no question about that, both in his Commander-in-Chief and in his police powers he could do that, right? That is exactly correct. The President would not need, and I would hope the government wouldn't argue, that the President would need the authority from Congress to shoot down a plane that was headed towards the World Trade Center. Again, the question is... Or to take, militarily take control of those people. That's correct, Your Honor. The hijackers who were, let's say, hypothetically apprehended on September 10th would have to be charged in due time and undergo a full criminal trial. Yes, Your Honor, that's what... No, that's not true either, because the Patriot Act, or at least if it happens thenceforward, we have the Patriot Act that they can be detained under. Isn't that correct? Yes, they would have to be charged within seven days. As far as the AUMF is concerned, it's your view that the September 10th hijacker who was apprehended on September 10th could not be subject to detention under the AUMF, but would have to undergo a full criminal trial. Well, Your Honor, the government has other tools. They cannot be subject to military detention. Yes, but I'm talking about... Let's put those other tools aside. We're talking about something Congress has passed. Could the hijackers be detained under the authority of the AUMF? No, Your Honor, they could not. And Congress made abundantly clear when it enacted the Patriot Act, which was considered at the same time... I don't understand how an authorization for the use of military force, which relates specifically to the September 11th attacks and this country's response to the September 11th attacks, can be held not to apply to those who attacked us on September 11th. In other words, the AUMF is passed 
with the purpose of responding to the September 11th attacks, and you hold it not to apply to the September 10th or September 11th attackers. How, how can that be true to congressional intent? Your Honor, the AUMF plainly authorized the President to use military force uh, against the uh, perpetrators of the 9-11 attacks and those that harbored them, and, and it was enacted um, specifically uh, with the idea of, of sending military troops abroad. The Supreme Court, Your Honor, has considered the AUMF but now twice. But the AUMF twice. uses the word at home. Well, Your Honor, so does the Patriot Act, and the point is that the, it is an authorization to use military force Why don't you stick abroad. With the authorization? Are you are challenging the authorization at all? In other words, the legality of Congress's authority to issue the authorization? Your Honor, no. Our, our challenge to the authorization so the question is, is whether the authorization applies, not whether it's authorized, right? Your Honor, our argument is that the authorization does not apply to this situation, and that if it did apply, it would violate the Constitution, Your Honor. It would violate ex well, parte that's milligan. My, that's, that's my uh, point, is the authorization is an exercise of sovereignty by both Congress and the President. And it's directed against international terrorism, directed at the United States, and it authorizes the use of force against anyone, anywhere. Right? Well, the AUMF doesn't say that, Your Honor. It says the use of all necessary, it says all use of necessary force. But again, the, but the key point is anyone, anywhere. And the, the catch to distinguish this from a civilian type of process in the Patriot Act is the fact that it has to be linked to 9-11, it has to be linked to international terrorism, and it has to be linked to a threat against the United States. And it seems to me that your argument has to be the authorization doesn't apply because I cannot think that Congress and the President didn't have authority to protect the sovereignty of the United States in those circumstances. The, ar the argument is that the AUMF does not apply to authorize the indefinite detention of an individual well, in this country. Let's stick with that argument as to whether the uh, uh, use of necessary and proper force authorizes indefinite detention, because that could be the issue. But it seems to me the Supreme Court may have put that to rest. Your Honor, the Supreme Court has twice considered the AUMF, and both times the Supreme Court has made perfectly clear that the AUMF is not a blank check. Is it is problem, constrained is by... Is the problem that the AUMF does not use the word detention, in your view? Is it the fact that that one word is absent well, Your Honor, from that's the what... AUMF? Well, that isn't, can't be your problem, because the Supreme but, Court in Hamdi said that, you, that detention was considered part of the use of force when you were detaining somebody who had been a combatant in an enemy, enemy battlefield against the United States. Uh, your position, I think, has to be that the authorization for use of force doesn't, among other things, authorize the use of military force against civilians in the United States of America. It nowhere says in the United States, for example, does it? No, that's correct, Your Honor. And in fact, when the Congress looked at the Patriot Act, which was considered at the same time as the AUMF with the same purpose, the Attorney General but the, asked the, the language, Congress. the language of the AUMF is not confined geographically. The language of the AUMF isn't confined to a battlefield, is it? It's not confined to abroad. It was, it was passed in response to an attack on the American homeland, and it contains no words of geographic limitation. There are, there are limiting concepts in the AUMF, namely that there has to be a link to Al-Qaeda. That's a limiting concept, or those who plan the September 11th attack. But the limiting concepts in the AUMF are those that require links to terrorist groups. The limiting concepts in the AUMF are not geographical limits. There's no way you can read that authorization and say it's geographically limited as opposed to limited by requiring specific links to those who plan the September 11th attacks. Isn't that critical? Your Honor, the AUMF must be read that way because that's what, because the Supreme Court said the AUMF is constrained by the laws of war and it's constrained by the Constitution. And it is plain, Your Honor, from the context of the AUMF and the Patriot Act enacted again simultaneously that Congress 
did not silently authorize the indefinite military detention of individuals in the United States. You're overlooking the fact that the Patriot Act defines its application to terrorist aliens, which is a category under our immigration laws of somebody who's here as an alien who's not a citizen. And terrorism is a broad category of violations that includes this, but also includes all our criminal laws relating to terrorism. Whereas the authorization is focused at anyone anywhere who's linked to 9-11 and international terrorism directed against the United States. And it seems to me that Al-Mari facts bring him under the authorization almost by concession. Your Honor, no, there is a absolute silence. There's a deafening silence in the AUMF about its application to the United States. How do you explain Padilla? Your Honor, Padilla may only be justified if it was read as the panel opinion read it, as an individual who took up arms as part of Taliban forces in Afghanistan. It's clear about its applicability to a detention on United States soil, isn't it? I mean, doesn't it fairly directly refute your argument with respect to locus? Your Honor, no. I mean, your rationale has to be that that person was escaping from a battlefield and hadn't been able, the United States troops hadn't been able to capture the person on the battlefield and therefore had to capture him in the United States and the AUMF would permit that. It wouldn't permit the capture of somebody that's never been on a battlefield and certainly not escaping from a battlefield. Exactly, Your Honor. The AUMF can only be read in the way that Your Honor says. If the AUMF is read more broadly and if the Padilla decision is read more broadly than that, Your Honor, we submit the Padilla decision was wrongly decided and should be rejected. Moreover, it's abundant. It doesn't bind on bank court. Not only does it not bind this on bank court, Your Honor, but subsequent developments in Padilla have robbed that decision of any judicial significance or applicability. And this court should be loath to read Padilla more broadly than the panel decision read it in light of those subsequent developments and in light of what was quite clear from the second opinion in Padilla where the government, in fact, doesn't even really believe that Padilla could have been detained and the government apparently intentionally mooted Padilla before the Supreme Court could decide it. If in fact the Congress consider adding in the United States to the AUMF and reject it. Your Honor, there is nothing specific in the congressional record. There are statements that Senator Daschle made that it was rejected. But again, Your Honor, putting that aside, there is absolute silence in the AUMF. And to read the AUMF more broadly, Your Honor, to read the AUMF to authorize indefinite military detention of suspected terrorists in the United States would directly contradict the Supreme Court's holding in Milligan. Your Honor. The most remarkable argument I can think of. You have 25 or 30 terrorists who sneak into the country and are assisting those same people who flew the jets. And if we know that those 25 or 30 were part of the planning and operation, we couldn't pick them up under this authorization, even though they were the direct planners and persons executing the attack against the United States. That's remarkable. I mean, Congress was exercising its full sovereignty to protect this country against this attack of foreign terrorism. And if they were here in the United States, if they were here in the United States, it seems to me the authorization would authorize the President to pick them up in the United States. Don't you believe? No, Your Honor. Unless it was to prevent it, as the President would have the authority without the, you know, independent of the AUMF, as Commander-in-Chief, to repel sudden attacks. I don't want to duck the issue. The AUMF was an authority by Congress and the President to follow up on the 9-11 attack and pick up anybody who may have been responsible wherever. And it's not limited to outside the United States. And it's a remarkable thing to argue that if we had all these people working around in New York and planning flights for the next day and the next day, and it was all clearly linked, that we couldn't pick them up under the military power. Your Honor, the Supreme Court. I didn't realize that was your argument. I thought that you recognized that if there was direct involvement, that you had a somewhat different situation. Well, Your Honor, that's your argument? 
The AUMF does not authorize the military detention of individuals in the United States. Well, they put Dr. Bali and put him in a civilian court, right? He was supposed to have been involved. That's right, Your Honor, as with every other individual who, Richard Reed, now Jose Padilla, and dozens and dozens of others. He was the 20th hijacker. That's right. He said he was the 20th hijacker, and he was tried in a court in this circuit. That's exactly right, and he was convicted and sentenced to life in prison, Your Honor. That's the system. The president has ample tools under domestic law enforcement to prosecute terrorism, and certainly it does not apply to— Let me just step back for a second, because I think one of the things that we're concerned with and that you're properly concerned with is that the AUMF may have authorized some sweeping detention program that's going to just get out of control and that we are going to have people swept off the streets of Omaha and put in brigs without anyone knowing. And the question I have for you is this. Does that really—is that really borne out by experience? Because the AUMF has been in force for six years, and we're talking about two individuals, Padilla and Almari, who were detained pursuant to its authority, and both of those seem to me to have undisputable ties to al-Qaeda. Almari didn't even try to controvert the declaration that said he had trained in Afghanistan and had been in contact with al-Qaeda leaders and had came over here to be part of a sleeper cell. So we're talking about—we're not talking about a dragnet. We're not talking about a sweep. We're not talking about an indiscriminate roundup. We're talking about two people in six years with undisputed ties to al-Qaeda. And what I don't understand is whether we have—why does that kind of carefully targeted response by the government generate all this apprehension, all this anxiety, and if I may say all this hoopla? Haven't we really lost our sense of perspective because we are simply not talking about the kind of mass roundups that occurred in previous periods of this country's history after World War I with respect to German Americans, during World War II with respect to Japanese Americans? The present enemy combatant steps have been remarkably limited and seems to me have detained people within the core of the congressional expression. I'm not sure that they've been pushing the edges on this. So why, in light of the fact that we're talking about two people with undisputed al-Qaeda ties, is there all this apprehension that this program is going to burgeon way out of control and we're going to have the executive rounding up A, B, and C tomorrow? Your Honor, because the principle the executive puts forth crosses a line that must never be crossed. Remember the facts in this case, Your Honor. Mr. Almari is not a member of the enemy armed forces. There is no allegation of any participation on a battlefield or any direct participation in hostility. And whatever Your Honor might conclude about the scope of the AUMF, there is nothing within the language of the AUMF that was necessary and appropriate about declaring him an enemy combatant when he had already been detained. When he was detained, Your Honor, had been detained for 17 months on criminal charges, which if convicted, Your Honor, given the allegations, he could have gone to jail for 25 years, Your Honor. But isn't the answer to that question that the calculus for determining constitutionality is not whether we have a good king or a bad king, but whether or not that king has improper power. It's not about whether he stays his hand in generosity. That's not our constitutional question. And here I think your argument is basically that they're right in terms of AUMF doesn't have geographical boundaries. It doesn't have citizenship boundaries either. But if it's going to be applied without those boundaries and definitions of a battlefield and it applies to civilians without a suspension clause being enacted, 
then it's unconstitutional, isn't it? That is exactly right, Your Honor, and that is exactly the decision in Ex Parte Milligan, Your Honor. If the president would be granted this power, whether it's one or 1,000, Your Honor, as the court said in Milligan, Republican government is at a failure and is the end of liberty regulated by law as we know it. Your Honor, it doesn't matter whether there's one or 1,000. What do you do with the fact that he trained in Afghanistan? What do we do with the fact, at least it seems uncontroverted, that he trained in Afghanistan? He trained in an enemy camp. He trained in an enemy camp preparing for an attack upon the United States. This is not an individual who simply grew up in one of our communities or cities. This is somebody who trained in Afghanistan. Your Honor, even taking the allegations as true, which I understand we're asking this court to do in this posture, the allegation that Mr. Omari trained in Afghanistan was before there was, under the government's own view, there was any armed conflict, Your Honor. And Mr. Omari, as a resident of this country, has the same constitutional rights. As the Supreme Court has said, he stands on equal footing to a citizen with respect to the right to a criminal trial under the Fifth and Sixth Amendment and the right to habeas corpus. What implications does our decision today have with regard to American citizens? Your Honor, if this court were to approve Mr. Omari's detention, it would be approving the detention of American citizens in the same situation, arrested in the United States based on allegations of terrorism. The Supreme Court has said in the Hamdi decision, in the Kieran decision, that the issue of citizenship is not the dispositive factor. It is whether someone is an enemy combatant. So if Mr. Omari, who is not a member of the armed forces of an enemy nation, who has no connection to any battlefield or any allegation of direct participation in hostilities, can be declared an enemy combatant, Your Honor, you are sanctioning the detention of American citizens as well. Mr. Hafez, I see your time is getting short, and I wanted to explore the question of whether the Military Commissions Act has taken away jurisdiction from us to even hear this case. And it seems to me there's a serious question there because the act applies to not only cases where there has been a determination, but also to cases that are pending, habeas petitions that are pending. And this one was pending on October 17, last year, when the act was passed. And at that point, the act seems to suggest that this should go to the combatant tribunal and then be appealed to the D.C. Circuit. That's where Congress seems to have placed it. Why isn't that act applicable to this case? Because, Your Honor, as the panel decision makes abundantly clear, and as we've argued, the act does not apply to lawful resident aliens such as Omari. Your Honor, the act clearly applies only to individuals who are detained at Guantanamo Bay or elsewhere outside the United States. Of course, that was amended out of there, right? It applies now to anybody in the United States? No, Your Honor. What the review procedures are available to individuals in the United States, but the jurisdiction repeal that the Section 7 plainly, if you read the language, does not apply to someone in Omari's situation. To elaborate, it doesn't apply under the first prong because the first prong requires an initial detention and a subsequent executive branch determination that the detention was proper. That plainly doesn't apply to Mr. Omari. Just take me through this. I'm looking at 2241E, which takes the jurisdiction away, and it basically says no judge, justice, or court has the jurisdiction to hear a habeas case who has been determined by the United States to have been properly detained as an enemy combatant or is awaiting such determination. And, of course, as we know, right after the passage of this act in October, in November, the Defense Department did indicate that order that this man be subjected to the tribunal upon dismissal of this case. Well, that's not quite what the government said. They said that that was how they intended to handle Mr. Omari. But, Your Honor, the point is what Congress intended. There's an order issued by the Secretary of Defense committing this man to the tribunal 
upon termination of this case. Your Honor, the executive has had more than four years to give Ms. Delmari a CSRA. This was done in November, sir, of last year, which was a few days after the act was passed. It was a month after the act, and it was on the day the government filed its motion to dismiss. Your Honor, the government's had four years to give Ms. Delmari a CSRT, and at the time... The act was made applicable to pending cases in October. The question is, Congress said as of October 17, it applies to any case pending as of that date. It applies to any case pending, Your Honor, that the act applies to. It applies to pending cases that are covered by the act, and this case is not covered by the act, Your Honor, and if it were, it would be a suspension of the writ. You have to remember what Congress, Your Honor, was... When Congress enacted the AUMF... Sorry, the Military Commissions Act, there was no law policy requiring Ms. Delmari receive a CSRT or any indication Congress believed he would be eligible one. Your Honor would have to take the... reach the absurd conclusion that the MCA, which is intended to apply to people without constitutional right, or the Congress believed had no constitutional rights, eliminated silently, without any judicial review, any right to judicial review, the rights of someone... It's not stating a lot of things all at once. What happened is Congress passed a law saying we're taking habeas review from the federal courts and putting it into this system of combatant tribunal, which is reviewable in the D.C. Circuit, and they did that to not only cases in which a person has been determined to be a foreign enemy combatant, but in which that determination is pending. Yes. Then shortly afterwards, they issued... the Defense Department issued an order placing this man in line for that determination before the tribunal. That was, what, November 17th? Your Honor, but... And the question is now why isn't that determination pending as stated in this act? Because, Your Honor, Mr. Omari was not... is not awaiting such determination within the meaning of the act. Congress made abundantly clear that it was only intending to repeal habeas for those individuals who it believed had only a statutory right to habeas, individuals at Guantanamo and others held outside the United States. It made explicitly clear in the history... It doesn't say that. I'm reading... I'm reading the stripping statute, 2241E. I don't see any of what you're arguing there. No, Your Honor, that is in the... that is in the legislative history, but the statute, Your Honor, if you read the statute, the only way the statute makes sense, Your Honor, is if it was intended to apply to individuals who Congress believed did not have constitutional rights. Otherwise, Your Honor, you would have to reach the conclusion that Congress inadvertently repealed habeas jurisdiction without any... without any substitute for an individual... No, but... But, Your Honor, there was that... Appeal to the D.C. Circuit. But there was... at the time Congress enacted... No requirement that that substitute be given. There was no requirement and there was no indication that Congress believed Mr. Omari would be eligible for one. In fact, the evidence is to the contrary. In more than four years, he was never given a CSRT. What you're saying doesn't make much sense because if he has not been determined to be an enemy combatant or if it's not pending, then he has rights under habeas. But if it has been determined or if such determination is pending, which is this case, then he is... has to go through the tribunal and up to the D.C. Circuit. And I don't see why there's a compulsion. It seems to me either they are going to declare him an enemy combatant. They don't have to declare him an enemy combatant. But if they do, then the way to review that is through the tribunal and the D.C. Circuit. Your Honor... That's what Congress created. No, for the reasons I've explained and explained the panel opinion, it's plain Congress did not intend to repeal jurisdiction over this action. Moreover, Your Honor, the decisions of the U.S. Supreme Court... Stay with that. Let's just stay with one thing at a time because the dialogue isn't carrying on if we can't get some kind of resolution as to where there's a difference or an agreement. The statute has to have language otherwise if you say it doesn't apply. And I'd like you to point out in the statute where it doesn't apply to this circumstance, in this case, where the Secretary of Defense has determined that this man will be declared an enemy combatant or not by the tribunal. On the second prong, the awaiting such determination prong, which is, I believe, what Your Honor is referring to, because you cannot read that language to apply to Mr. Omari because at the time Congress enacted the MCA, it was... he was not awaiting a determination under the Act. There was no law 
policy or regulation that required he be given one, and there was nothing to indicate Congress believed he would be eligible one. Again, it would, your construction would produce the absurd result that Congress guaranteed a right to habeas for Guantanamo detainees. Individuals Congress believed had no constitutional rights, correctly or not, without providing any administrative procedure or form of judicial review for an alien in this country who has undisputed and uncontested constitutional rights. Moreover, Your Honor, the decision, every single decision of the United States Supreme Court addressing the suspension clause says that there must be an explicitly clear statement and intent to repeal habeas. We certainly don't have that here. In fact, the intent of Congress was plainly not to reach this case. You don't think it's very clear when they say no court, justice, or judge shall have jurisdiction to hear or consider an application for a writ of habeas corpus? Your Honor, but that, you're only reading part of the statute with respect. Well, sure. Of an alien detained by the United States who has been determined by the United States to have been properly detained as an enemy combatant or is awaiting such determination. That carefully crafted language was intended to apply to Guantanamo detainees and others outside the United States, but not to Mr. Omari. Can I ask you a technical question? Do you challenge the constitutionality of the transfer of custody from civilian to military in and of itself? In other words, let's suppose it had been for one day. Do you challenge the constitutionality of that transfer? Yes, we do, Your Honor. That our argument, the third argument I outlined at the beginning is that even if Your Honor assumes there was some, there's some military detention power to authorize, to allow for detention of suspected alien terrorists in the United States, as applied to these facts, Your Honor, it is outside the scope of the AUMF and it violates the Constitution because there was no exigency, there was nothing that was necessary and appropriate in the words of the AUMF to authorize Mr. Omari's transfer after set, when he was in custody for 17 months. What provision of the Constitution does that violate? Your Honor, it violates the Fifth Amendment. It violates the right to due process. In what particular? Your Honor, the right, the Fifth Amendment and the Sixth Amendment, which include a, the right to a criminal trial, Your Honor, and I would take, Your Honor, back to the decisions of the Supreme Court in Milligan and in Duncan, Your Honor, where, and to quote Justice Murphy in Duncan, Your Honor, to authorize military detention and to deny criminal rights, there must be some overpowering necessity, Your Honor, that makes recognition of those rights incompatible with the safety. Is there a due process right with regard to that transfer? I didn't hear that. Is there a due process right with regard to that transfer from civilian custody to military custody? Absolutely, Your Honor. It is a fundamental due process right because in civilian custody, an individual who's detained on allegations of wrongdoing has a right to challenge their detention and test the allegations of criminal trial. To strip someone of those rights by yanking them from civilian jurisdiction without any explanation and after 17 months of custody on the eve of a criminal trial, Your Honor, would violate the most essential principles of the Due Process Clause. Suppose the government were to determine that he was charged on credit card fraud, as I understand it, and Almari was initially. Suppose the government were to determine that putting on its case with respect to credit card fraud would involve the divulgence of all kinds of classified information. Does that make a difference? No, Your Honor. It doesn't make a difference. Hasn't Congress enacted a statute to deal with that? Exactly. The Congress has enacted the Classified Information Procedures Act to specifically deal with that. Your Honor shouldn't assume, should not get ahead of Congress in assuming that Congress silently repealed the fundamental protections of the Constitution without any kind of clear statement, particularly in light of the contrary evidence in the Patriot Act. And moreover, Your Honor, the charges on which Mr. Almari was prosecuted, the credit card fraud charges, Your Honor, those charges were in the courts for 17 months. There was no indication that there was any danger to national security. And if Mr. Almari had been convicted on those charges, he could have been put in jail for 25 years if the government had... You seem to assume that because some other statute is available that the AUMF can be set to one side. I mean, I don't... Multiple authorizations of authority here. I was curious about your view that you think that, or at least you suggested it, that citizen combatants and alien combatants 
belong in the same category and that what we decided with respect to or what we might decide with respect to an alien combatant would necessarily apply to citizen combatants. I mean, there, there are differences in the law as respects immigration. The Supreme Court's made clear that the same rules need not apply to citizens and to aliens, and one could say perhaps that the amount of that the number of procedures or the amplitude of procedures would differ um, between citizens and aliens. Uh, citizens can probably invoke a greater array of constitutional rights. The point is I'm not at all convinced that a, a case involving an alien combatant would apply across the board to citizen combatants. So I think that might that uh, those kinds of questions would seem to me to have to await another day. Well, I, I don't think so, Your Honor, because um, we're talking if we're talking about alien uh, aliens who are lawfully residing in the United States, because they have the exact same constitutional rights to criminal trial, the exact same rights under the fifth and sixth, uh, the fourth, fifth, and sixth amendments as do uh, citizens, Your Honor. I would. Um, call Your Honor's attention to Chief Justice Roberts' um, decision in Sanchez Yamas, where he made clear, affirming more than a century of uh, unquestioned Supreme Court precedent, saying that aliens in the United States the have Supreme, the same constitutional and yet rights. The Supreme as, Court and so, Hamdi seem to uh, attach special significance to the fact that that Hamdi was a citizen because he was captured on a battlefield in Afghanistan, Your Honor. I, we certainly recognize that the Constitution, if it applies at all to non-citizens captured in Afghanistan, is, has, is very different than when the non-citizen is arrested in the United States. Non-citizens, our argument is limited only to non-citizens who are lawfully residing in the United States. Well, Mr. Hafiz, would you um, agree with Judge Wilkinson that there are situations in which lawfully resident aliens have different constitutional rights than citizens. What your position, I guess, is that the Fifth Amendment rights are no different and have said, the Supreme Court has consistently said no different, and Chief Justice Roberts says a foreign national, like anyone else in our country, enjoys under our system the protections of the due process. He said that less than a year ago. Exactly. So uh, we don't even have to rely on those 1800s cases, and cites one of those old cases. Right. That's that's exactly right, Your Honor. That certainly Congress um, has power over immigration to uh, non-citizens to deport them. There are certain those are certain rights. But when the the right to the um, the criminal trial under the Fifth Amendment is the same for a non-citizen and a citizen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Judge. Judge Williams, and may it please the court. Just one week after the 9-11 attacks, Congress passed an authorization for use of military force that expressly backed the president's use of all necessary and appropriate force against the nations, organizations, or persons responsible for the 9-11 attacks in order to protect the country from further attack at home or abroad. The habeas petitioner in this case is almost identically situated with the al-Qaeda forces that struck on the morning of 9-11. He trained. Can I ask you about that initial statement when you talked about, which is certainly correct, that the AUMF was enacted less than or a week after the attack. Um, because the government had cited legislative history in its petition for rehearing, I went and looked at, and, and tried to do some looking at legislative history myself, and the the day after or the day before the president signed the AUMF, the attorney general called on the Congress to pass the legislation, which became the page. We're on the same page. Sure. Agree. And there is extensive legislative history about whether illegal detention I mean, indefinite detention will be part of the Patriot Act. And the administration has suggested it needed indefinite detention as part of the Patriot Act. And ultimately, uh, when not just um, Senators Kennedy and Senators Biden, but, but uh, Senator Specter, Senator Hatch, and Senator Kyle, and others said that that was not consistent 
with the Constitution. The administration dropped that. And now I'm wondering if illegal detention, had, I mean indefinite detention, had been authorized by the AUMF. Why was there this extensive discussion about the illegality or the legality of indefinite detention in the Patriot Act? Well, first, Your Honor, let me say that we agree with what you said in your panel decision, that if this court agrees that Mr. Elmari is an enemy combatant, is covered by the authorization for military force, then the Patriot Act is of no moment. The president has the authority to put him in a military box. Right, and I'm looking at the Patriot Act to inform what your take on the AUMF is. And with respect to the Patriot Act, that provides important authority to the Attorney General and the government to deal with civilian detentions. There are a number of tools that the president has at his disposal to deal with terrorists and to deal with acts of terrorism. But you understand my question. Why was there so much debate and why did the administration want the power to indefinitely detain these terrorist aliens in the United States in the Patriot Act if it already had the power to do this? I think we're dealing with a much broader class of individuals who are potentially... There's no discretion from anybody. We already have the power to go against al-Qaeda here. And we're talking... Have you ever found that? Your Honor, we're talking about legislative history. Have you found that, sir? I'm sorry, found what? Have you found any discussion about, well, we've already got the power to detain al-Qaeda operatives indefinitely in the United States? We're talking about acts passed in the same general time period. Right. Where I think the administration made clear its support for the authorization for use of military force and has repeatedly made clear its view that that authorization authorizes the military detention of al-Qaeda fighters who come to this country or who fight abroad against America and American interests. I don't think that that can be disputed. The Patriot Act is... The administration may have thought that, but both Senator Daschle and Senator Specter have said that the words in the United States were suggested by the administration in the AUMF and the Senate and Congress would not go along with those words. Your Honor, the words that I look to in the AUMF are the words that say it was intended to protect against attacks, quote, at home and abroad. I also look to the Supreme Court's decision in Hamdi, which of course interpreted the AUMF to authorize the fundamental incidents of war, including the detention of enemy combatants. Now we can debate as to whether or not Mr. El-Mari falls into the category of enemy combatants. Let me just clear this up. Just one more question. You would, you recognize, we're on the same page, that if, that the AUMF doesn't authorize the military detention of someone who is not an enemy combatant? I would say, I mean, I think there's a lot of debate about who is an enemy combatant and who is not an enemy combatant. I think it all, it's, the Supreme Court has said... And you said we can argue about that, but you're not, the government's not maintaining that the AUMF authorizes detention of non-enemy combatants, is it? That's true, Your Honor, and if I could explain, though, the Supreme Court said that it authorizes the fundamental incidents of warfare and it looked to the law of war. And certainly the Congress has a say in what the law of war is, and the Congress has made clear in the Military Commissions Act that al-Qaeda fighters qualify as enemy combatants. Of course, the Military Commissions Act was enacted, what, two years after El-Mari was militarily detained. So it can't be used as a definition about whether he's an enemy combatant. Well, I would disagree, Your Honor. We're here today talking about whether or not Mr. El-Mari is lawfully detained, and we now have the benefit... To determine the definition of enemy combatant under the AUMF, you look to the MCA? I think that that is a further indication. We know that Congress views al-Qaeda fighters as enemy combatant, and the judgment of Congress is at least relevant as to what the law of war is. So do you look to the law of war? I would, Your Honor. Karen and Padilla and Milligan and Hamdi all look to the law of war. Do you look to the law of war? Yes, and what I would look to first, if I were on the Court, is pages 37 and 38 of the Quirin decision, where the Supreme Court said that individuals who associate with enemy forces and with the aid, direction, and guidance of the enemy come to this country bent on committing hostile acts are enemy belligerents within the meaning of the law of war. That's what the Supreme Court said in Quirin several decades before Mr. El-Mari came to this country. It's the definition that this Court adopted in the Padilla case, and it's a definition that should control this case. Mr. Garre, let me 
ask because I'm, I'm interested in the evaluative process that the executive uses to determine who is an enemy combatant. You, um, you're asking for a good deal of, of deference to that determination. Um, and I notice that you say, well, it's a, the evaluative process is a combined, uh, is a combined input of the CIA and the um, uh, Department of Defense and the FBI and presumably um, OLC. Uh, I think one of the concerns, of course, is that, uh, that the, uh, you know, these agencies w work in a multi-layered process and they work, uh, they're not, there's not a lot of transparency, perhaps necess necessarily, but it's a closed process and it's, it's an ex-party process, to say the least. But I want to know how the executive goes about determining whether someone is an enemy combatant and what would justify in this determination, the kind of the the extent of the deference that you're asking from the courts. Yes, Your Honor. First of all, with respect to deference, the, the president, particularly where he's, where he's acting with authority backed by the Congress, is entitled to great deference in the exercise of his authority under Article. But II. I want to know and about the specifics of this process that the executive uses to determine this designation, because it. it you can't, you can't just say there's an Article II Commander-in-Chief power and, and that can't be the end of it. So just tell me, walk me through the steps that someone is determined, because that has a lot to do, I think, with the question of whether this is, is careful and whether this is carefully targeted or whether we're dealing with something that, 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 that threatens to leap proper bounds. It is extremely careful, Your Honor. Mr. Almari is an alien, but he benefited from the process that the executive uses to determine whether a citizen is an enemy combatant. You're talking about individualized assessments and determinations from the Department of Defense, the Attorney General, the CIA, the FBI, collecting all information available to the government, much of which is classified because of the context in which these determinations are made, making assessments, and then where those different agencies agree, as they did in this case, they presented those assessments to the president, and the president himself made a determination. Are those assessments made independently, or is it it's some interagency working group? I think it's both, Your Honor. They're made initially ind ind independently, and those, those assessments are shared before the matter is presented to the president. The president here made that determination. He spelled out, and this is reprinted at page 54 of the Joint Appendix, why he determined that Mr. Almari is an enemy combatant. And, of course, Mr. Almari benefited from the process that the Supreme Court established in the Hamdi case for citizen enemy combatants to test that enemy combatant determination in a courtroom in a full-fledged habeas proceeding that Mr. — that District Court uh, Judge uh, Carr, uh, Floyd uh, uh, carried out in the proceedings below. Mr. Almari had every opportunity to present his I side of the story. I understand that, but I, I'm, I'm again — I think the question that people have, and it's a legitimate question, is we we want to make certain that this is not a a a process and a that the process of determination and the definition are not going to simply metastasize and spin out of control. Um, is it the the, the Authorization for the use of military force, for example, I want to know how carefully you interpret this, is phrased in the past tense. The verbs are in the past tense. They talk about against those nations he determined, planned, authorized, committed, or aided the terrorist attack. By phrasing those verbs in the past tense, does somebody who began an affiliation with al-Qaeda after the September 11th attacks. Um, does that individual fall within the executive's uh, understanding of what an enemy combatant is, somebody who joined al-Qaeda in the summer of 2003? Because you might think this is hypothetical, but it's really not because we're, we're dealing with what the parameters of the exercise of executive power are. Now, what about that person that Joined in 2003, given the fact that those verbs 
refer to past tense. Somebody like Mr. Al-Mari, who closely associates with al-Qaeda overseas, even after 9-11, comes to this nation with the aid, direction, and guidance of al-Qaeda, could qualify as an enemy combatant. And the Congress's authorization of use of military force against al-Qaeda and its associates would apply. Even though the AUMF refers to those who planned or directed the September 11th attacks, how could the person who is a second or third generation al-Qaeda leader be involved in the planning? I'm just trying to flesh this out. Because the AUMF authorizes the president to go after, for example, the organizations that he determines were responsible for the 9-11 attacks. The president has determined, as has the Congress, that the al-Qaeda terrorist organization is responsible for those attacks. And just as in the case of a conventional war, where a military force that we're fighting against could have soldiers coming up at any point in the process, this nation is at war with al-Qaeda, as the president and the Congress have made clear. And individuals who go to fight with al-Qaeda, whether abroad or in this country, the authorization... Right now, we're talking about al-Qaeda, but that... Al-Qaeda is a diffuse group. I mean, there's a core of it, which apparently has been transplanted from Afghanistan to Waziristan or remote regions of Pakistan. But there are different terrorist groups that are more or less loosely affiliated with it, and financially or whatever. Are persons affiliated with groups which may not be formally under the umbrella of Al-Qaeda? Are those determined to be enemy combatants? I think that would present a much more difficult case, Your Honor. The executive would have to come in and explain why it believes that that organization is responsible for the 9-11 attacks or is supporting the al-Qaeda organization that was responsible for the 9-11 attacks. What about the complaint or the people that are involved in Bomadine? Isn't the government maintaining that those people are enemy combatants? Sure, and those individuals have... And those people, a lot of them had no... were in exactly the situation that Judge Wilkinson is hypothesizing. Well, I'm not sure which particular individuals Your Honor is referring to, but the individuals in those cases have been determined to be enemy combatants using the definition that Congress has authorized and that the CSIRT regulations use, which refer to members who are part of or supporting al-Qaeda forces. But you're incorporating that definition, which is broader than the definition that Judge Wilkinson read you from the AUM or the language of the AUMF is all past tense. Well, Your Honor... So I think that shows another reason why the MCA definition just doesn't work. To be clear, Your Honor, our position is that this Court doesn't need to look any further than the definition in the Quirin case that this Court used in the Padilla case. It says it's laws of war. How long, in terms of the... Excuse me, Judge Michael, go ahead. I was going to ask, how long can you keep this man in custody? You know, that's, I think, you know, Hamdi, I think, puts us or puts the AUMF into the laws of war. And in a traditional war, there's usually an end. And even in Hamdi and Padilla, I think the reference was to the conflict in Afghanistan. And there could be a discernible end to that. But what about this man? How long can you keep him in custody? Forever? I mean, because the way the war on terrorism has been described, it's been described as a very long struggle. So are you saying you can keep him in custody indefinitely and never let him out? Your Honor, the rule under the law of war is that captured combatants may be held during the course of ongoing hostilities. The Supreme Court recognized that in the Hamdi case. So what's the ongoing hostility here? There, they defined the hostility. It was the war in Afghanistan. But what's your war here? It was the war against al-Qaeda and the Taliban in Afghanistan. Here, I think the relevant conflict is the conflict against al-Qaeda. An important part of that conflict is ongoing. Worldwide? Anywhere? Well, I think potentially it could be, Your Honor, but I think an important part of that conflict is the conflict that is still ongoing in Afghanistan against al-Qaeda. It doesn't sound like you're limiting yourself to that. I mean, how long can you keep this man? Are you saying you're limiting custody here, just like Hamdi, to the conflict in Afghanistan? I don't know, Your Honor. We're not. I think the court could say. You're not saying that. That is not our position, Your Honor. So what is your position? Our position is that under the rule, under the law of war, the rule applied in that context, individuals can be held during the course of ongoing hostilities. Hostilities, we know at this point, are active and ongoing against al-Qaeda. 
at some point in the future, the political branches, which are charged with making these determinations. And the political branches are now projecting that that's going to go on for generations, perhaps. It, it could go on so for a long time. So you're going to keep this man in, in military custody for a lifetime, it, it looks like. It could go on for a long time, Your Honor. It what looks I, like a lifetime, am I right? Well, we don't know that, Your Honor. We certainly don't know that. The alternative is to, uh, to uh, detain people who are openly hostile to the United States through a terrorist organization and then to say through some artificial determination we're going to release them back so they can come and uh, uh, continue the war against us. That's true. I mean, whatever doubts the court has. You can't release them. You can't have a court house where they prop people like you did in Massawi. Well, Your Honor, Fidela, if you changed his status from enemy combatant and then you indicted him and tried him and convicted him. Indeed, there's nothing that would prevent you if the on-bank court should conclude that um, go your way for putting uh, Mr. Omari into the criminal process, is there? There is not, Your Honor, but I, I think it's... And you might well do that. If we follow precedent, you did precisely that in Padilla. Your Honor, as, this, as you yourself wrote in the panel decision in this case, if this court agrees that Mr. Omari is an enemy combatant and should be treated as such under the law of wars, then there's nothing that binds the president or the executive to deal with him through the criminal justice system. There are enormous advantages... There's nothing of the, that prevents you from doing that, and that's exactly what you did with Padilla. There is not, and there is nothing that prevents us from dealing with him through the military process, as the executive has in past conflicts. Well, for present purposes, uh, Al Qaeda is not a degraded force. I mean, it has regrouped from everything we can possibly understand in in the Waziristan area of Pakistan. It's reassembling itself. So the, I, I don't think, in terms of present purposes that anyone in this room would contend that the struggle with al-Qaeda has somehow lapsed, and along with it, the authority of the AUML. I, I think that's absolutely true, Your Honor. And Congress has shown no indication to modify this or, or, or to repeal it that's or to correct, narrow Your Honor. it. The one thing well, we I think it's proper to ask the question about how long the man might be held in custody because, you know, we don't have a traditional law of war situation, or a traditional war like World War II that had an end, uh, and, 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 and your so Honor, we're into uncharted territory. Your Honor, so we, I think it's proper to ask the question, isn't it, about how long he might be held in custody? Absolutely, Your Honor, and I think that that's one of the difficult legal questions that the courts have to confront in this situation. Your answer is the rest of his life. No, no that's not Honor. the answer. The it's, answer is it's up to Congress to repeal the AUMF, isn't it? If Congress believes that the state of hostilities in, that, that led and precipitated the events of September 11th have diminished in gravity, politically, that uh, the AUMF, we talk about the importance of the executive and Congress working in tandem, and the executive is acting pursuant to an authority of Congress. And if the, if the perceived threat lapses or diminishes, then it's up. It, isn't that a political question? And can't Congress, at that point, um, uh, narrow or repeal altogether the authorization that it granted the president on after 9/11? Certainly, it could, Your Honor. And then one other point I wanted to make. But isn't Judge Omari's Michael, argument that that is precisely what Congress did in the Patriot Act? So perhaps in forming in framing your response, you could elaborate. Uh, on what you view as the interrelationship between that broader, more general grant of authority and the more limited delegation of authority that followed fairly closely on its heels. Right, Judge Duncan. I don't think anyone is contending that the Patriot Act repealed the authorization for use of military force. No, court. but there is we, more limited language with respect to detention. That's, that's true. And the Patriot Act deals with civilian detention. is addressed to a different problem than military detentions that the authorization for the use of military force cover. And again, looking at the panel decision, the initial panel decision in this case, even that decision recognized that if this court agrees that Mr. Omari, someone who trained with al-Qaeda, met with top al-Qaeda leaders, volunteered for a martyr mission, uh, received funding from 9-11 financier al-Hasawi, and came to this country to commit hostile warlike acts, if someone like that meets the definition of an enemy combatant under the law of war, then the authorization of military force, of course, authorizes the president to use military force in the form of a detention of this individual. Does the uh, power to detain that you assert here apply equally to American citizens? 
Your Honor, we have assumed for purposes of this case that Mr. Omari has the same rights as a citizen enemy combatant, like the combatants in Hamdi and Padilla. Potentially, I would say this, though, Mr. Omari is an alien, and the Supreme Court has... You answered my question. Let me just ask the next one. I didn't hear the answer. Could you answer Judge Traxler's question? The final point I was going to make is... No, could you answer Judge Traxler's question? Does it apply to American citizens? We have assumed as a Supreme Court... The answer is yes. The answer is yes. Hamdi holds that, and Padilla holds that, and we've assumed that Mr. Omari, an alien, is entitled to the same protections, and he received those protections. I would say, and I wanted to follow up on this point, Judge Traxler, is that there would be nothing preventing this court from assuming that this case is limited to an alien and not reaching the difficult question. Well, we have a Supreme Court precedent that says that the reason the government has to say that the resident aliens have the same rights as citizens is because the Supreme Court said it repeatedly. Well, the Supreme Court has also, for example, in the Eisentrager case, made clear that there are distinctions between aliens and citizens when it comes... And we acknowledge that. Everybody acknowledges that. But as far as the Fifth Amendment due process right, a person legally resident alien in the United States has the same rights as citizens. Isn't that correct? That is true, Your Honor. Justice Roberts said it. I think that is true, Your Honor. But the Supreme Court in the Hamdi case also said in its first footnote that enemy combatant cases ought to be taken and viewed very carefully on a case-by-case basis with the particular facts of each case, and we certainly think that this court should keep very closely in mind the particular facts of this case. I was interested in your dialogue with Judge Traxler and want to hear that play out because the questions that he was asking... The next question is, do you believe that the power to confine carries with it or includes implicitly the power to seize? Yes. Under the authorization for use of military force, we think that it authorizes the military to capture and detain enemy combatants. In the situations we dealt with before, I think even where a person was in civilian custody first and then transferred to military custody. Right. But I want to make sure I understand where we're going and what the government asserts is the right of the military, if they believe someone is an enemy combatant, to go to the military to go and seize that person. That's true, Your Honor. That happened in Quirin. That happened in Padilla. No, it didn't happen. But they were seized, I believe, by civilian authorities. In both cases. And turned over to military. By the FBI. What you assert is the power of the military to seize a person in the United States, including an American citizen, on suspicion of being an enemy combatant by the executive. Yes, Your Honor. We think the authorization for use of military force would authorize the military to capture and detain an enemy combatant. What balance is there on the assertion and exercise of that power? The procedural framework that the Supreme Court established in the Hamdi case for citizen enemy combatants. And under that framework, the government has to come in and explain why it believes that individual is an enemy combatant. The government did that in this case in the declaration of pages 213 to 228. No check or balance on the seizure. Well. There's an after the fact. There is a hearing before a habeas court. No court in between the individual. No impartial person in between the individual and the executive. Well, Your Honor, but there wasn't in the Padilla and the Quirin situation where individuals are initially apprehended by the FBI. And it's not unusual. They were charged with civilian process, weren't they? And eventually they were turned over to the military. For example, to take the Quirin saboteurs, initially they were apprehended by the FBI, and then they were turned over to military authorities. But what you want is the power for the military to take them, take them back to the military base, and perhaps hold them incommunicado. Well, we don't need that in this case. But you did that here when you transferred into military custody. You have the power, if he's in military custody, to hold that person incommunicado. That's at least for some period. The Supreme Court in the Hamdi case said that at some point. It was 16 months in this case, wasn't it? It was, Your Honor. At some point that individual would have a right to counsel. And the Supreme Court hasn't defined. So you can do that to citizens as well. That's what the Hamdi court held, Your Honor. The Hamdi court recognized. When does the right to counsel attach? Your Honor, it attaches at some period after the initial detention. And the courts haven't had to flush out the particular line at which that right attaches. I think the assumption, I think, is that there is some period for the military to interrogate that person and to assess the situation to take into account the military threat posed by that person. Where are these rules located that will govern how long the military can hold them, what they can do to them, what forms of communication or 
outside world or relatives or friends or the person detained themselves. Well, Your Honor, I think the law of war, the Supreme Court decisions and the decisions of this court are developing and have developed a framework for citizen enemy combatants and alien enemy combatants to challenge their enemy combatant determination. What notice is required if the military goes and takes somebody off the street, nobody knows they've detained him, they take him and hold him incommunicado. What notice is required to the public or to the family about his detention? Your Honor, I think that particularly individual captured, individual captured in the United States, like Mr. Omari. And again, this is, of course, a hypothetical situation given that he was. It isn't a hypothetical situation because there is, in fact, one Supreme Court case that does deal with military capture of a citizen. One, ex parte Milligan, right? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you for bringing that up. And in that case, the Supreme Court held, no, you cannot have military detention of this civilian, even though the civilian planned the overthrow of the government with a group that planned the overthrow of the government, stealing guns, releasing prisoners of another nation, and was a member of a secret terrorist organization willing to do great crimes in the United States. Secret terrorist organization sounding a lot like Al Qaeda. Your Honor. And this was when our country was much smaller. That secret terrorist organization had more than 100,000 members in three states, three states of the union. Your Honor. Three states of the country. Do we, do you, does the government posit that we have 100,000 Al Qaeda members in the United States at this moment? No, Your Honor. Certainly we don't have evidence of that. But what I would say about. Sons of Liberty, that secret terrorist organization, which Mr. Milligan wasn't just related to or closely connected to, as Mr. Omari is, but had joined and was a member and was, it was a paramilitary organization. He held a rank in it. Military comes. Your Honor, with respect. Military comes and takes jurisdiction over him. The Supreme Court says, no, you can't do that. And with respect, Your Honor, we think that the Milligan case is completely different. What the Supreme Court said. Let me just ask you before you tell me how it's different. Do you, you do concede that Milligan is good law? Of course, Your Honor. Okay. On page 121 of the Supreme Court's decision in that case, the Supreme Court said that Mr. Milligan, a citizen, was, quote, in no wise connected with the military service of the enemy. On page. That's right. And that has to be the Confederate troop because we know from the rest of the opinion that he was a member of the Sons of Liberty, which is the secret terrorist organization. And on page 45 of the Quirin case, the Supreme Court made clear that Mr. Milligan was not part of or associated with enemy forces. Right. Now, Mr. Omari. The Supreme Court said, okay, we'll distinguish Milligan because had Milligan been captured while he was assisting Confederate soldiers by carrying a rifle against Union troops on a battlefield, the holding might well have been different. Making the precise distinction between assisting nation's troops and being part of a terrorist organization. We would disagree, Your Honor. What the court focused on, and this is on page 45 of the decision, Your Honor, he was not part of or associated with enemy forces. Mr. Omari is. He trained with Al Qaeda in Afghanistan. He met with top Al Qaeda leaders. He received funding from Al Qaeda financiers. All before we were at war in Afghanistan, according to the government. And then he came to this country to commit hostile and warlike acts. Mr. Garr, let me ask you a question, and it follows up a little bit on what Judge Traxler was asking about some of the procedures. The difficulty here is the magistrate judge found that the rap declaration and affidavit was never controverted and that Mr. Omari refused to participate meaningfully despite multiple opportunities to do so in challenging anything. It's called a Fifth Amendment, isn't it? But there would be no impediment, would there, to someone who was seized as an enemy combatant challenging the basis of their seizure in a Hamdi-type hearing. In other words, if somebody was picked up without any probable cause or was simply whisked by the military off the street, there could be the, if it was a baseless detention, 
there would be the opportunity, as I understand it, to, to challenge that in a Hamdi-like hearing, and I don't know how ample it would be, and there would be no impediment, as I understand it, to a Section 1983 suit raising a violation of, of, of Fourth Amendment rights. In other words, are there, are there channels to, to challenge baseless seizures and baseless detentions? And I would suppose that the Hamdi-type hearing would be one forum like that and a, and a subsequent civil suit for baseless detention uh, would, would be another. Am I correct in that assumption? Absolutely, Your Honor. The Hamdi framework is the framework that the Supreme Court held that the Fifth Amendment of our Constitution guarantees to citizens declared as enemy combatants. Mr. Almari had the benefit of that framework. As the magistrate judge explained on pages 244 to 246, he not only didn't respond to that, he didn't explain why he had extensive evidence of research into poisonous chemicals like hydrogen cyanide on his computer, why he had coded email communications with Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, why he repeatedly tried to call 9-11 financier Al Hasawi in the days after 9-11, the unusual circumstances of but rushing to come no to this country. But there were no roadblocks put in his way to challenging any of this, were there? He could have, he could have challenged any and everything about the government's actions. Absolutely. He could have challenged the... the, the, the um, uh, transfer from uh, from the uh, department DOJ custody to DOD custody. He could have challenged the manner in which he was seized. All of that's on the table, as I understand it. Absolutely. What's the person who's held incommunicado challenge these things? Well, <laughs> Your Honor, here he would challenge them in the habeas court proceeding that he was afforded. Six he knows months after he's. Well, more than 16 months, years. Well, I don't think we're arguing about when the habeas proceeding occurred. I thought the argument was about whether or not the government has shown that he has been lawfully detained, that he is lawfully detained today. And the government, as the district court and magistrate judge found, clearly met its burden under the Hamdi framework. Mr. Almari, as the district court and magistrate judge found, squandered his opportunity to present his side of the case. The district court said neither the due process nor the rule of law in general permits a party to participate only in those procedures that he deems best. And we would agree with that. And if I could make one other point, and I wanted to get back to a question that Judge Duncan asked earlier about the locus of detention, the fact that Mr. Omari was not captured on the battlefield, and indeed was not on the battlefield at any time. The Supreme Court in the Quirin case dealt with that same exact argument. And here's what the court said on page 38 of its decision nor are petitioners any less the belligerents if, as they argue, they have not actually committed or attempted to commit any act of depredation or entered the theater or zone of active military uh, operations. The fact that Mr. Almari was not captured on the battlefield, was not captured before he was able to commit the terrorist attacks that he came to this country to carry out, in no way impedes the executive's authority to detain him consistent with the acts of Congress consistent with the law of war, consistent with the precedence of the Supreme Court and this court. If there, do, you, do you believe that the exercise of power under the AUMF must be consistent with the provisions of the Constitution? Yes, Your Honor, and, and those provisions were interpreted in the Hamdi case to establish the procedural framework under the Fifth Amendment, again, for a citizen enemy combatant. Mr. Omari, an alien, had the full benefit of those protections. He decided not to participate in that proceeding, and he should not get the benefit of, on the one hand, deciding not to participate, and on the other hand, claiming that he's entitled to more process than a citizen would be entitled under our Constitution. Just briefly, uh, uh, just in a moment, address uh, the jurisdictional issue that I had raised with uh, your colleague. Yes, Your Honor. Last fall, in the Military Commissions Act, Congress explicitly removed habeas jurisdiction and established a different procedure, including judicial review, for all aliens who have been determined by the United States to have been properly detained as enemy combatants or awaiting such a determination. In our view, Mr. Omari meets the description of the category over which the, the Congress removed habeas jurisdiction, which would mean that Mr. Omari would be afforded a C-cert as the Deputy Secretary of Defense has ordered if this court dismisses his case for lack of jurisdiction and then would have an opportunity to raise all of his legal and constitutional arguments through the judicial review procedure that Congress established in the MCA. Now, we recognize that Mr. Almari's situation is probably different than the large category of cases that Congress had in mind when it enacted the statute, 
We did feel an obligation to bring this jurisdictional issue to the intention of the court, and we do think that properly read, Mr. Elmari would fit into the category of cases where Congress specified this alternative means. But if this court disagrees, we would urge the court to make clear that its ruling is limited to the facts of this case. If there are no further questions, we would ask this court to affirm the district court decision dismissing Mr. Elmari's petition for habeas corpus. Thank you very much. Thank you. Your Honor, I want to address first the habeas proceeding, Your Honor, and what was described as Mr. Elmari's by the government, quote, squandering his opportunity. Mr. Elmari has no obligation to submit to the wrong process. As we've discussed, he is an individual in this country. He has unquestioned constitutional rights, including a right against self-incrimination, a right to be presumed innocent, and a right to have the government prove its case beyond reasonable doubt at trial. It is astounding, Your Honor, that the government would criticize Mr. Elmari for exercising those rights in the very proceeding designed to test whether or not he can be held by the military. Moreover, Your Honor, it is more astounding, given that if Mr. Elmari were, could substantially prejudice himself in that proceeding, and the government could turn around tomorrow and indict him, just as it has indicted Jose Padilla, and subject him to criminal penalties. Your Honor, this is not a game. This is a man's life, and Mr. Elmari has the right to know what the rules are in the proceeding and to have it determined whether or not he can be held by the military before he's forced in a habeas proceeding that contains none of the essential safeguards under the Constitution. Your Honor, I want to turn briefly to the Kieran case. The Kieran case was limited. The court repeated at least a half a dozen times in that opinion that the Kieran saboteurs could be detained because they were under the military arm of the German government. They, as such, and as the government argued at page 10, I believe, of their brief in that case, they had a belligerent status under the laws of war and could be treated as combatants. Your Honor, the treatment of combatants... Do you think we could legitimately analogize al-Qaeda with a foreign enemy in Kieran? I mean, we're in a new era where the traditional forms of war probably will not be seen again. But we do have a serious threat from international terrorism in the form of al-Qaeda and other organizations. And can we lawfully, under the Constitution, deal with that threat using our military power as opposed to being left to treat that response in our civilian courts? Two responses, Your Honor. First, the answer is under the Constitution, no, and that's ex parte Milligan. But, Your Honor, even if the court were to disagree with that, what Your Honor is describing would require an absolute clear statement from Congress. There would need to be a concrete statute laying out exactly what the parameters are, and it's for Congress. It would be for Congress, not the court to decide, and then the court to evaluate it under due process. But Congress has not done so, as we've explained, and under ex parte Milligan, Your Honor... This is the problem, is that you say Congress has not done so, and there's this same argument was made in Hamdi that they hadn't used the word detention, so Congress has got to go back to the drawing board. And so we require Congress to get ever more specific. We pick apart the language of the AUMF, but there comes a point where the court just keeps constructing hurdles in the path of Congress and asking Congress to do something which it has already done. Well, Your Honor, we submit... I mean, there's a question here of moving the goalposts. Your Honor, we believe under any circumstances the indefinite four-plus years and potentially lifelong military detention of someone arrested in this country would be unconstitutional. But again, as we've argued, Congress has not done so. Congress authorized the use of force, and Hamdi could be detained, Your Honor, because he fell squarely within the laws of war. Is there anything about the detention that Mr. Almari is precluded from contesting if he wishes to do so in the hearing below? 
Well, Your Honor, while we understand that the court must, for purposes of our argument, take the allegations as true, it does bear noting that the declaration relies, is larded with hearsay, and it's precisely the type of hearsay that the Constitution prohibits. It is hearsay, includes hearsay from individuals who have been interrogated in government custody. It is precisely the principal evil that, as Justice Scalia said, that the Confrontation Clause is meant to prevent. You criticize the government for not providing rights that this gentleman has never sought to invoke. Well, Your Honor, he's invoked them. He's invoked his right to a trial from the get-go and argued his detention was illegal. He was held for 17 months incommunicado, and, Your Honor, the only individuals he's able to talk to now are his lawyers with security clearance. In more than four-plus years, he hasn't been able to speak to his family, including his wife and five children. And while the government holds out a possibility of a... So to help with this procedure, he'd have to give up his Fifth Amendment right. That's exactly right, Your Honor. That's exactly right. Let's return to the question I had, which I didn't really finish, and I'm curious to know your position on this, that al-Qaeda, if we assume al-Qaeda is an ideologically driven organization but not a nation, that was responsible for attacking the United States on 9-11 and killing more people than were killed at Pearl Harbor. Your suggestion is that we cannot treat al-Qaeda as a surrogate for a nation under our general war powers and military power. Your Honor, the President has in his power to use military force against al-Qaeda. What we believe the Constitution prohibits, Your Honor, is that the President can indefinitely detain individuals without charge based on allegations of terrorism. That's not my question. My question is we have some traditional rules of war that have been articulated in our various cases, and one of the criteria is that we be at war with a nation, a sovereignty. Well, al-Qaeda is not a nation in the traditional sense. It doesn't have sovereignty over a particular territory. It's an organization driven by an ideology, I suppose, against the West. And this organization, we have determined, is responsible for attacking our country and causing a lot of harm. And my question is can we legitimately, under the Constitution, treat an organization of that type as a foreign nation for purposes of exercising the war powers of the United States? I'm talking about Congress and the President. Again, Your Honor, our position is no, it would violate the Constitution to be able to detain individuals in this country. However, Your Honor, again, Congress, this Court doesn't and should not reach that weighty constitutional question because Congress hasn't authorized it. We have to capture all these people who are not part of a foreign nation and bring them into civilian courts and punish them as opposed to just exercising the military power and incapacitating them so they can't attack us anymore. Your Honor, if they're lawfully within this country, yes. What if they're not lawfully within this country? Your Honor, the Supreme Court, to quote the Supreme Court in the Curtis Wright decision, the Constitution does not have force outside the United States except with application to its citizens. Our argument is limited to the individuals within the United States. And, Your Honor, I submit that the power the government is asking for is exactly the power that this country rebelled against, that the President or the leader would have the authority to render the military superior to the power committed to the President is to defend our country from just such attacks. Your Honor. Now, just because the attack wasn't done by a country within organized boundaries, it was done by an organization militarily armed, designed and planned, well organized, large in number, and could cause severe harm and did cause severe harm to our country. Now, we rose up and responded with military force, not civilian force. We didn't say the minute we catch you, we're going to bring you into our courts and try you. We said we can bomb them, repel them, detain them, kill them, anything to protect the sovereignty of the United States. And we treated them that. And your suggestion is that our treating al-Qaeda in that fashion violates the Constitution. Your Honor, actually, I don't think that's an accurate description of what happened. The military used force in Afghanistan, and there was certainly a war there, and those captured in that war, like Hamdi, could be detained as enemy combatants. But actually, I'm not aware of any case where the military has been used to capture anyone in the United States. I'm only aware of the numerous Milligan. Right, Milligan. Used to capture? That's right. That's right. I meant since 9-11, Milligan was not a foreign 
was not the enemy and he was not foreign. Here we have somebody outside of the United States, an international terrorist organization that has been, has determined itself to cause us and to continue to cause us harm and to bring us to our knees if they can. Well, Your Honor, Judge Mott demonstrated... To suggest that the war power can't be used there is a fairly aggressive argument, isn't it? Your Honor, Judge Mott described the danger Milligan posed, a grave danger, and this case I submit is really Milligan in modern dress, and the Supreme Court said Milligan must be treated within the criminal process. I just want to briefly address the comment before about the limits or the absence of limits to the government's power. There are no limits, as was made plain, about really who the government can hold and how long they can hold them. And the Supreme Court, Justice O'Connor, in the Hamdi decision, was very cautious in explaining what the detention power was on the AUMF and emphasized that the detention power was there... I think you said there are no limits when a hearing has been provided to test those limits. Well, Your Honor, that was a hearing that was designed for the battlefield. Justice O'Connor said the reason Hamdi could be detained... I don't know that it was a hearing that was designed for the battlefield. The court in Hamdi simply decided the case on the facts before it. But you say there are no limits to what the government can do and no limits to what the government... Your Honor, I haven't heard a principle... Excuse me a second. Sorry. That there are no limits to whom the government can seize, there are no limits to what the government can do. And yet there's a hearing pursuant to 2241 in which Mr. Almar is represented by counsel, and the hearing exists for the very purpose of testing those limits. Now, exactly what... How many procedures should be afforded and everything is something we haven't gotten into because there wasn't any joining of that issue and invocation of those procedures below. But to say there are no limits when there's a hearing provided expressly by the Supreme Court and under the laws of this country, 2241, by virtue of the power of habeas corpus to test those limits, I can't understand how you arrive at what is your basic position, which is to, you know, inculcate an atmosphere of fear about there being no limits. There's no limit to who the government can put into the category of enemy combatant and take out of this criminal justice system. But to go back to Justice O'Connor, in the Hamdi decision, the rationale, it wasn't just the facts, it was the rationale, and the reason Hamdi could be detained was to prevent his return to the battlefield and prevent him from taking up arms again. There's no allegation Mr. Almari was on a battlefield or near a battlefield. There's no allegation he ever took up arms, Your Honor. And Justice O'Connor cautioned about precisely this situation, this type of situation, this type of extension of military power and said it would cause the understanding of the AUMF to unravel. And, Your Honor, I submit that what we have here is a total unraveling of the AUMF and of the authority to seize individuals in the United States, to seize individuals in the United States. There are no further questions. Thank you. We'll come down and speak to counsel, and then we'll take a brief recess. On tonight's American Perspectives, the Carnegie Medal of Philanthropy is awarded to Teresa Hines, the Mellon family, the Tata family of India, and Eli Browd. Star Parker, a former welfare recipient, 